This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we discuss psychological and emotional issues and what you can do about them, whether that's learning self acceptance, taking action, or seeking therapy or treatment. Eight years ago, I extended the walls of my practice to reach those of you who might already be knowledgeable about mental health treatment, but also to those of you who might say you'd never darken the door of a therapist. And yet, you are here. I'll answer your questions while I invite you to take a few minutes for your own self-work. I saw an old high school friend years ago who'd moved from our hometown to Northwest Arkansas, and I totally forgot that her mother had died. I asked, how's your mom? She looked at me more than a bit surprised. I felt awful. But in this episode, we're really not talking about just true mistakes you make out of a memory lapse. We're focusing on when you really care, when you're trying to be there for someone you love. How do you voice that? Welcome to this week's edition of Self Work. Often, people come into therapy because they are grieving something that's happened to them or someone they love. From getting through divorces to illness to deaths, your life can be turned on a dime in a seeming second. And you need your friends and loved ones to get out of the way and understand that you're grieving, but at the same time, provide comfort. But that's not always what you get. Maybe it's laughable, but often either the most self-centered or stupid or awkward responses will come your way. Again, well-meaning often, but sometimes you have to laugh. That's what we're going to talk about today on self-work, how not to respond to someone who's going through something. I'll use an article that one of my own clients told me about, an opinion piece from the LA Times written by psychologist Susan Silk and Barry Goldman a few years back, but it's still extremely timely because people still don't know what to say or who to say it to when it comes to hard emotional stuff or who it's okay to vent to and who it's not. The listener email today is from a self-work listener about her identification as an HSP or a highly sensitive person and both the relief and confusion that brings her. As usual, our sponsors are incredible. I did my taxes this year and they gave a lot of support to this broadcast and that's because of you. That's because of you trying them out. And I promise you, I will never have a sponsor on self-work that I personally don't believe in. So here's better help with their 2024 offer to self-work listeners. We're ending 2023 and coming into 2024, and last year was a hard year for many. 2023 held cultural uproar and violence and worldwide anxiety. So in welcoming 2024, more people than ever are recognizing that their own sense of personal direction is being affected by what's going on in the world and not in a good way. Talking about that can help you see how to cope with those anxieties while also keeping your emotional stability in check. It helps to vent and to hear yourself make connections with your strengths while admitting your struggles and getting an objective perspective. After you make the first contact, BetterHelp standard is to offer names of therapists to you in less than two days, and you can talk to them in a first session to see if it's a good fit by video, text, or chat. But if it's not a good fit, rather than going through an awkward call or email, you simply let BetterHelp know, and they'll ask what it was you didn't like and find someone else for you. I'm a therapist because I got good therapy. I know how much of a difference it can make. And here's BetterHelp's offer for self-work listeners. 10% off your first month of sessions if you use this link, betterhelp.com slash self-work. There's never a better time than now, today, to reach out and get help. Betterhelp.com slash self-work. One of my clients sent this article to me saying she wondered if it might be good content for a self-work episode. When I read it, I more than agreed. Now, the article is from a 2013 L.A. Times opinion piece written by psychologist Susan Silk and Barry Goldman. And the full article will be in the show notes. But I thought still it was extremely relevant. They were writing about Susan's going through breast cancer and some of the problematic comments she heard from others who were worried and trying to help, trying to say and do the right thing. But there is something amiss. 
Rather than trying to summarize, I thought I'd read their words straight from the article. So here I'm going to quote. The authors, Susan and Barry, must have been partnered at the time when they wrote this, so that's the context. When Susan had breast cancer, we heard a lot of lame remarks, but our favorite came from one of Susan's colleagues, and obviously that is said sarcastically. She wanted, she needed to visit Susan after the surgery, but Susan didn't feel like having visitors, and she said so. Her colleague's response, this isn't just about you. It's not, Susan wondered. My breast cancer is not about me, it's about you. The same theme came up again when our friend Katie had a brain aneurysm. She was in intensive care for a long time and finally got out and into a step-down unit. She was no longer covered with tubes and lines and monitors, but she was still in rough shape. A friend came and saw her and then stepped into the hall with Katie's husband, Pat. I wasn't prepared for this, she told him. I don't know if I can handle it. Now, this woman loves Katie, and she said what she did because the sight of Katie in this condition moved her so deeply. But it was the wrong thing to say. And it was wrong in the same way Susan's colleague's remark was wrong. So I'm going to go into why they think it's wrong in just a minute. But if you're like most people, there are times when you've stuck your foot in your mouth. I saw an old high school friend years ago who'd moved from our hometown to northwest Arkansas, and I totally forgot that her mother had died. I asked, how's your mom? She looked at me, more than a bit surprised. I felt awful, although I didn't know her well, but our dads had been good friends, and that fact about her mom I should have remembered, or at least it felt that way in that moment. Of course, I apologized, and she was kind, but it definitely was awkward. But in this episode, we're really not talking about just true mistakes you make out of a memory lapse. We're focusing on when you really care, when you're trying to be there for someone you love, when you're worried or more than concerned, how do you voice that? And to whom do you talk? The two examples these writers give are great ones and may on the surface not feel like all that big a deal. But think if you were the recipient of such a comment. I need to see you when you're the one that's ill and don't feel like having company of any kind. The fact that it was a colleague, not even a family member or close friend, suggests that this felt like an intrusion, making Susan's illness, her cancer, something that was hard for the potential visitor, rather than about Susan's own emotions and fears. Now, it's not stated whether Susan voiced again her needing privacy, but I hope so. Maybe Susan's actions and thoughts feel a little selfish to some of you, but who's really being selfish, Susan or her colleague? I realized when I wrote that question that I'd been assuming the colleague's need to see Susan was about her concern for her, but maybe it was truly about a personal need of her own. Obviously, I'm not sure. But on the other side of the coin, if her colleague cared that much, couldn't Susan show a little empathy? Something was getting stirred up for her colleague. Maybe her own mom had died from breast cancer. Who knows? But more about this as we talk about what direction these comments need to go in. Now let's tackle the second example when the person said, I don't know if I can handle this. I've heard this kind of comment more than once. And actually, I think it's pretty appropriate and even emotionally aware when you know that you really don't have the emotional bandwidth or mental fortitude to handle a situation that's medically difficult, to see someone you love as sick as they are. If you truly know that you aren't the kind of person who can cope with what you're going to see or hear or smell, then sometimes not choosing to do that is the most kind thing you can do. There are obvious exceptions to this when staying away from someone will hurt them. If it's a child or someone who's dependent on your support, then finding ways to be there is vital, even if you don't have experience with that kind of situation. But if you can't be that kind of support for a friend or loved one, be the friend who picks up their kids for the weekend and entertains them. Maybe if you know someone who's grieving, rather than sticking close to their side, you come in and clean their house, or you run and get groceries. That's a wonderful way to show caring and love. We're not all the same in what we can do and cope with and what we can't, and that's fine. That's more than fine. 
What I admired about the conclusions that these authors came up with in the article was that they didn't shame people for having a rough time or being the kind of person that simply needs to do something else rather than being there for you at the time. It's human to sometimes be a little self-centered about how someone's illness or struggle might be affecting you, or maybe you get weak around the knees when faced with loss and things that scare you. Again, that's human. And it can be hard to see someone you love who's very, very sick. You can be triggered by even being in hospitals, smelling certain smells, seeing blood, or even thinking about blood. There are many things that can trigger anxiety or panic in us, sometimes unexpectedly. Rather than the person who's in crisis being teed off or feeling like these comments are unkind, the author suggested a conclusion that was full of common sense and, as I said before, was kind and empathic. Their major point is this. Rather than the problem being what you express, it's who you express it to that's important to consider. What does this mean? They came up with a witty slogan, comfort in, dump out. As I said before, one of the authors is a psychologist, Susan Silk, and she calls this ring theory. Here's the official definition of ring theory by Wikipedia. The concept developed by clinical psychologist Susan Silk advises those surrounding a person in crisis to direct expressions of their own feelings of stress toward those less close to that person and direct only support toward those closer to the person using a diagram of concentric circles to illustrate the concept. Comfort in, dump out. Let's break this down a little bit more. Imagine concentric circles, meaning there's one tiny circle in the middle of your page within ever-widening circles around it. Okay, can you see that now? Now, put a dot right in the middle of the smallest circle. So, if you're the one in crisis, you're the dot. You're the one that's sick or grieving or going through something very difficult. The next circle represents those that are most affected by your struggle, your spouse, your children, if you're an adult, your parents and siblings, if you're a child. The next widest circle would include, again, as an adult, parents and siblings, maybe best friends. It depends, obviously, from person to person. Then church members or other friends, other family members, neighbors, people you know from a club, people who feel close to you, people who work with you. You can go on and on until you've reached the widest circle. Now, you might have trouble making this diagram for yourself, or you might have some discomfort thinking about it for others in your life. Who would you put in what circle? It's kind of interesting to think about. But it might also be hard for you to think about where someone you love would put you. For example, I imagine myself as a mom, which I am, and some psychologist, me, is telling me that if my adult son is sick, maybe I'm not in the most inner circle. I could feel myself getting a little huffy about that, (laughs) not liking the demotion to the second circle in a way. But if my adult child has a spouse and or kids, I'm not in that closest circle. I'm close, but not that close. And that's a boundary that's often a problem. I recently contributed to an article that appeared in the online platform Yahoo, and I'll have a link to that for y'all. It was written by a colleague of mine. It was on grandparenting and what to do if you thought your grandkids were spoiled. Maybe their parents, one of whom is your kid, quote unquote, is using a gentle parenting technique, which seems to be very popular these days. So, what was my advice about how these grandparents should talk to their quote-unquote kid? Frankly, my common sense wrote that keeping those boundaries in mind from the very beginning of your adult child's partnership or marriage sets the stage. If you've established a respectful and supportive relationship, and they have with you as well, then you've established trust. Then when some crisis comes along or you have conflict, Maybe you can risk pointing out something that you're concerned about. And again, this kind of advice can go both ways. But if you haven't, then approaching a time of crisis or living through a time when fears are high and emotions are more complicated can be more difficult. So my role as mom or mom-in-law needs to respect my child and vice versa, but I can sort of feel I'm getting off the subject. (laughs) I just want to talk about that a little bit. So let's go back to our concentric circles. 
Basically, the point of the column was this. You want to comfort in, dump out. Now, what does that mean? Here's another quote from Dr. Silk. Here are the rules. The person in the center ring can say anything she wants to anyone, anywhere. She can kvetch and complain and whine and moan and curse the heavens and say life is unfair and why me? That's the one and perhaps only payoff for being in the center ring, the one in crisis. Your life is being very affected by the person in crisis. And of course, if you actually are the person in chaos, you also can give yourself lots of permission to say what you need to say. Everyone else can say these things too, but only to people in the larger rings. So let's break this down a bit more. If the person you're talking to is closer to the person in crisis than you are, you offer comfort only. And that means comfort in any way you can, as we were discussing before. If the situation is too hard for you, if they're in hospice or they're very ill or their grief is very raw and you don't know what to do about that, then offer comfort in another way. That's more than fine. Comfort can come in many different varieties and is still seen and felt as the comfort it's meant to be. But if you need to dump, meaning you need to talk about what's hard for you, or what you're worried about, or how helpless you feel, talk to someone less close to the situation than you. That can be a therapist, actually. You're talking to someone who probably doesn't even know who you're dumping or venting about, and they can support you easily. But the dumping can also occur with other friends, They might have or people in your own support group. The rule of thumb is this. Comfort is offered into the circles. Dumping or venting or talking about things are affecting you. You dump out. Now, this episode is not to infer that tragedies or sorrows or illnesses or deaths don't have ramifications for other people. Of course they do. A teenager at a high school kills themselves, and a ripple effect is a well-known phenomenon that the community needs to watch out for. But you don't talk about those concerns with the parents of the now-deceased child, unless they reach out to you. Maybe that's another point. If the person most affected, the person going through the crisis, reaches out to you specifically, wanting your feedback, wanting to know how it's affecting you, then they're giving you permission to vent, of course, with care. I wonder as I say this, if that might mean that the primary mourner doesn't really know what to do, so they may be reaching out as distraction to their own pain, or just to hear them talk about what they're going through and want to know what you're going through honestly. But all in all, this simple slogan, I think, is a very wise rule of thumb. Comfort in, dump out. If you want to learn more about ring theory, it's explained in Wikipedia, and I've included the link. The listener email this week reads... First of all, I want to thank you for the insight you provided to my husband and me about an issue I wrote to you about a while ago, the impact my enmeshed mother-in-law was having on our marriage. It was sound advice, and we're in a completely different place now, which is a quick way to say we've worked really, really hard, which I totally agree. Good for them. And I'm glad I was helpful. Next, I wanted to write to you to see if you had gotten response from a highly sensitive person regarding hurt feelings. I am a highly sensitive person. I've read the books, I've attended a retreat with other highly sensitive people, and I'm also in the thick of trying to get to the bottom of how my hurt feelings intersect with my sensitivity. This topic probably deserves an entire podcast, as there's a lot of talk and research and books on HSP or the highly sensitive person. I want to say quickly that HSP is not a diagnosis, but it is a term many people feel applies to them. I loved this question because she's trying to understand what sensitivity is hers to claim, but not shaming herself for having more sensitivity to the feeling state of others around her or to being much more stimulated by external stressors than others, but wanting to understand what role it plays in her day-to-day life. The one thing I want to say today is that high sensitivity is a real thing. It's not just someone choosing to be sensitive or touchy. 
Here's what an article in Very Well Mind had to say about the research. High sensitivity exists in at least 100 other species aside from humans. Research suggests that high sensitivity is an evolutionary trait that increases the likelihood of survival because HSPs are on the lookout for potential predators or dangerous situations. Of course, constantly being on guard when there aren't any immediate threats often results in anxiety. Research also shows that a lack of parental warmth growing up may cause a child to develop high sensitivity and carry this trait into adulthood. The same goes for negative early childhood experiences. So if you experience trauma as a child, you may be more likely to become an HSP as an adult. And I, for one, have a sense of how much trauma is out there. And it's a lot. You know, the more I talk about this, the more I think this would be a really great episode for next week. So let's do that. There are definite positives about being an HSP, but there are struggles it can cause as well. Please do write me and let me know your questions on this at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com. Maybe you're partnered with someone who is highly sensitive. What's the best way to handle that? How do the two of you work that out and reach some kind of understanding? What if you have a child who seems to respond differently, more strongly, to internal or external stimulation, and you don't know what to do? I'll ask a couple of my child therapist friends how they differentiate between a child that's going through something to the child whose temperament is more sensitive from the get-go. Now, I'll say here that I don't like when parents label their children. I don't particularly want to be labeled. Do you? Probably not. So we'll talk more about this on next week's self-work, episode 387. You can email me again at AskDrMargaret at DrMargaretRutherford.com or leave me a SpeakPipe voicemail that you can find right here in the show notes or on my website at DrMargaretRutherford.com. Either would be wonderful. So we've got a plan for next week. That's great. (laughs) I love that. Thank you so much for being here. You are the lifeblood of self-work. Usually when we are honored by being in someone's list of top 10 depression podcasts or whatever they say, they always mention Dr. Margaret likes to answer questions from her audience, and I do. Sometimes the feedback I give doesn't fit. Sometimes it's not right. And you can always let me know that as well. As I often say to my own clients, I'm not going to sit here and think something and not tell you, but that also does not mean that I'm correct. I may have mentioned last week, but I want to mention one more time because I'm, again, very honored. My TEDx talk was ranked in the top 50 TED Talks of 2023 as far as viewership on YouTube is concerned. And I could not be more thrilled because I'm so passionate about the message of perfectly hidden depression and the need for us to be emotionally transparent with each other, even having very hard discussions sometimes. The book Perfectly Hidden Depression is available wherever you buy books. Give that indie bookstore a a lift by ordering from them. And I am in the process of trying out a second book. I'll let you know more in the near future. Thank you for being here, as always. Please take care of yourself, your loved ones, and your community. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.